Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Dana Farber's Department of Data Science Frontiers in Biostatistics webinar. My name is Erica Fike, and I am the program manager for the department. If you have a question for the speaker or the organizers, please use the Q&A tab in your web browser. Our faculty organizers will manage the Q&A both during and after the talk. At this time, I will hand it over to Hajime Yuno, who will introduce our speaker for today. Yeah, so uh, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Frontier in Biostatistics seminar. Uh, today we have Dr. Su Yu Liu. Uh, Dr. Li is an associate professor of biostatistics at the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, she is the uh, biostatistics core director uh, for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, Specialized Center of Research in High Risk Plasma Cell uh, Discretions. Uh, also, she is a PI of American Cancer Society uh, Mental Research Scholar Award uh, on major adaptive designs uh, for uh, early phase clinical trials of immunotherapy. And her research focuses on uh, the development of novel adaptive designs uh, for clinical trials, uh, which includes uh, phase one trial design to find the MTD, and also phase one, two design to find the uh, recommended dose uh, accounting for both uh, toxicity and efficacy, and also adaptive randomization and, and so on. So the study design uh, she proposed have been used uh, in multiple studies. Uh, so today she will give us a talk about the, uh, the Beijing phase one, two trial design for immunotherapy. So, okay, Dr. Liu, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, please take it uh, from here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a basic phase one, two trial design for immunotherapy. Uh, this work has been uh, partially supported by uh, my American Cancer Society mentor grant. Um, uh, first, uh, let me give you guys some introduction on immunotherapy. Uh, cancer immunotherapy uh, represents the most promising new cancer treatment approach since the first uh, chemotherapies were developed in the late 1940s. Uh, immunotherapy treatment harness and enhance the in innate power of our own immune system to fight the cancer. And as we know, like uh, immunotherapy approaches include the use of anti-tumor monoclonal antibodies, cancer vaccines, and uh, non-specific immunotherapies. And we know like now uh, immunotherapies tend to uh, revolutionize the treatment of almost every kind can of cancer in, in these days. Mm. We know like uh, immunotherapy has different functional mechanism compared to uh, chemotherapies. In chemotherapy, we always assume efficacy and toxicity monotonically increase with the dose. Uh, but this property doesn't exist for uh, immunotherapy anymore. The dose efficacy curve for immunotherapy often plateaus or even decreases after a certain dose level. Uh, the immune response is a unique and uh, an important outcome which measures the biological efficacy of immunotherapy agents in activating the immune system. Pado's 2012 paper described several studies showing post-treatment immune responses correlated with clinical outcomes. And nowadays we know like in many of the immunotherapy studies and uh, to study the association between immune response and the clinical outcome is one of the important uh, objectives for those uh, clinical protocols. Therefore, it is critical to incorporate the immune response uh, for efficient and practical decision making. Uh, because the mechanism is different, so the, uh, uh, the objective of the dose funding studies for immunotherapies uh, will be different. The primary objective of the dose funding trials for immunotherapy is to find the optimum biological dose, we call it OBD rather than the maximum tolerated dose MTD in conventional chemotherapies. And OBD, the optimal uh, biological dose is defined as a dose having the highest desirability in terms of the efficacy toxicity trade-off. Uh, therefore, the development of uh, immunotherapy has changed in the conventional uh, more is better paradigm. Uh, this figure shows us a typical uh, dose response curve for immunotherapy. 
uh, studies. So the x-axis represents the dose level from low to high, and the y-axis represents the toxicity probability and efficacy probability. The blue curve here represents the toxicity probability. We can see like as dose increase, the toxicity increase. And uh, for, uh, for uh, conventional chemotherapy, you can see like uh, we often determine the MTD uh, only uh, considering uh, toxicity. And the dashed line represents the maximum acceptable toxicity. And according to the dose toxicity curve, we can see like if we purely based on our decision made uh, on the uh, toxicity uh, curve, and we will recommend the dose level three as MTD. However, uh, the efficacy for immunosensor no longer is more is better, right? It's not no longer a monotonic increase. And in this uh, example, the efficacy first increased, but after dose level two it become, apply, uh, become flat. So if we consider both efficacy and toxicity, definitely we would like to recommend dose level two as an optimal biological dose. So you can see like uh, uh, when we uh, consider the recommended dose for uh, chemotherapy uh, and immunotherapy are different. The, uh, the proposed method is motivated by a clinical trial, which is a phase one, two trial to find the optimal dose for a novel PD-1 inhibitor in patients with recurrent and chemoresistant ovarian cancer. In this study, we consider four dose levels. Uh, from 0 0.1 milligram to 0 0.9 milligram. And a uh, planned sample size maximum of 60 patients will be treated. And for efficacy in point, the efficacy response is characterized as complete response, CR, partial response, PR, stable disease, SD, and progressive disease, PD here. For immune response, and in here, we use the number of CD8 T cell measured in the tumor biopsy at the end of the first cycle of the treatment. And we uh, expect this uh, immune response is associated with the efficacy of the treatment. And for those limiting toxicity is defined as grade three or higher toxicity is happening in the first cycle. Before I introduce the models of the uh, design and uh, let me introduce some notations first. Uh, let J, the capital J, uh, be the pre-specified number of doses. So we have dose level uh, D1 to uh, Dj from low to high. You know, let Yt be the binary uh, toxicity outcomes with Yt equal to one indicating patients experience DLT, uh, the dose limiting toxicity and uh, equals zero means no DLTs. And YE be the efficacy outcome, and uh, which is a trinary ordinal outcome. And we have YE equals zero, one, two, indicating uh, outcome as progressive disease, stable disease, and uh, PR or CR. Uh, for immunotherapy, we also consider immune response. Here we use YI, and which is a continuous variable measures the count of CD80 cells. And therefore you can see like the outcome used for those finding in this uh, study is a trinary vector, including immune response, uh, toxicity outcome and efficacy outcome. Uh, we know like uh, during the dose finding uh, process, dose finding uh, part and adaptive de decisions uh, in the trial are made based on the behavior of the outcome Y as a function of uh, those level D to reflect the fact that immune, uh, for immunotherapy, like clinical responses depends on the activation of the immune system. The joint distribution of the Y, I, Y, T, Y, E is factorized uh, uh, in this way. The marginal distribution of immune response and the uh, joint conditional distribution of uh, Y, T and Y, E conditional on the immune response. So you can see like we have also factorized the parameter theta into theta uh, one and theta two, two sub vectors. 
Uh, first, uh, let's uh, take a look of how we model the immune response. We model the marginal distribution of immune response y i using an Emax model, and uh, the functional form is like this. And the parameter alpha zero is the baseline immune activity in the absence of the immunos immunotherapy, and alpha one is the maximum immuno uh, maximum immune activity that are possibly achieved by the immunotherapy above the baseline activity is often uh, called Emax. And alpha two here is a dose that uh, produce half of the maximum, maximum immune activity. Alpha three is a heel factor which controls the stiffness of the dose response curve. And uh, epsilon here is the uh, random error and follow a normal distribution with uh, variance sigma square. And uh, for toxicity and uh, efficacy model, we use latent variable approach. And here the ZT and the ZE denote two continuous latent variable. Uh, and uh, for the toxicity of an outcome YT equals zero if ZT is less than the cutoff Y uh, uh, that one. And uh, if, if this latent variable is greater than or equal to that one in a way, let the uh, outcome yt equal to one. And similarly, we use two cutoff values to define the outcome of uh, efficacy ye. And you can see here, uh, the z1, uh, c1, c2 are no cutoffs to define uh, the value of uh, toxicity outcome and efficacy outcome. ZT and ZE can be interpret interpreted as the patient uh, latent traits. And we assume like the latent variable ZT and ZE follow up a very normal distribution. And uh, this is the mean structure and this is the variance covariance structure. We model the relationship between the mu T, uh, the mean of the toxicity uh, and uh, immune response and the dose level using this functional form. And you can see like, a, uh, so the, for, the, for the uh, mean uh, of uh, toxicity uh, is associated with the uh, uh, dose level. And, uh, and also we have a third uh, term and which models the relationship between the toxicity and the immune response. And here we use the indicator function and the indicator function equals one when yi is greater than beta three because severe uh, immune related toxicity will occur only when the therapy induced the immune response exceeds a certain threshold of beta three. For the efficacy, uh, for the mean structure mu e, uh, we assume a quadratic uh, model and it's like this. And the quadratic term accommodates the possibility that the efficacy may not uh, monotonically increase with the immune response. Uh, although it can't directly model the increasing plateau uh, shape, it gives a reasonable local fit to get the dose acceleration and deacceleration. Uh, on top of it, because we use the Emax model, um, uh, model like the immune response YI, which allows uh, the YI to with the dose D and the efficacy model indeed accommodates the case that efficacy YE plateaus with the dose level D. So the next question is how we specify the prior. For the Emax model parameters, we uh, elicit uh, prior estimates of the uh, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three from uh, clinicians uh, as the uh, prior estimates uh, alpha uh, J hat and assign alpha parameter follow an uh, independent gamma distribution with mean at uh, alpha J hat and uh, uh, variance uh, tau J square. And here tau J square, we give a relatively large values to a button uh, weak prior. And uh, for all the parameters in the uh, toxicity and uh, uh, efficacy model, we use uh, uh, regularized weak prior for those parameters. We scale the input variable uh, to have a mean zero and a standard deviation 0 0.5 and assign each of the regression coefficient of those betas and gammas an independent uh, normal prior uh, like this. And uh, 
doing this, and we know like a, a change in any of these covariates from one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean, most likely a results a difference of less than 2.5 on the probit scale. So that also can achieve, you know, we uh, specify a prior, uh, a weak prior for those uh, coefficients. Uh, to define the desirability of the dose, we use utility function approach. Here we use a utility function U to map uh, multi-dimensional outcomes into a single uh, index to measure the desirability of a dose in terms of a risk benefit trade-offs. Uh, this table uh, just uh, an example of the utility function and which is used in the proposed design. And uh, to simplify uh, you know, the process to do the utility score uh, elicitation and a way that economize the immune response as desirable and desirable. And uh, so we through this, we find the most uh, uh, undesirable scenario, which is when we have toxicity and uh, also have an undesirable uh, uh, immune response and have uh, uh, efficacy uh, being a uh, progressive disease. Then we give a score zero. And uh, then we identify the most desirable scenario, which is we don't have toxicity, have a desirable uh, immune response, has a most desirable efficacy outcome, which is a CR and a PR, and we give a score 100. Then you realize that like uh, the rest of the scenario basically is just between these two extreme uh, scenarios, and we give a score between zero and 100, depending on the desirability for those scenarios. So uh, this slide just to summarize what I just uh, say, how we uh, specify, how, how we elicit the utility. So the utility should be elicited from the physicians and or uh, patients to reflect the medical practice. Uh, we dichotomize the uh, immune response as desirable and not desirable based on cutoff value uh, specified by the clinicians. Then we fix the, uh, the score uh, for the most desirable and undesirable uh, uh, cases as a zero, uh, score 100 and uh, zero, and use these two cases as a reference then we elicit the scores for other possible outcome from clinicians, which must be uh, located between uh, zero and 100. The purpose of dichotomizing YI here is to simplify the elicitation of utility from clinicians. Uh, of course, if we believe like a uh, mm, immune response can be uh, very different between these two categories, like a desirable and desirable, you can do like a low, medium, high, and give different desirable uh, uh, scores and to specify utility. Of course, the table will be much bigger than the previous slides show you. Uh, one possible uh, criticism for, of using uh, these utility values is that they require subjective uh, uh, input. However, we are uh, inclined to view this as a strength rather than a weakness. Uh, first, uh, the utilities must be listed from our physicians planning the trial. Thus, their numerical values are based on the uh, clinician's uh, experience in treating the disease and uh, observing the good and bad effects of, of the treatment. And secondly, the process of specifying uh, the utility requires physicians to carefully consider the potential risks and the benefits of the treatment that uh, underline their clinical decision-making in a more formal way and incorporate that in the trial conduct, trial planning. In addition, uh, our simulation studies and the previous studies also show that uh, the design is generally not sensitive to the numerical values of the utility, as long as it reflects the uh, similar trend. So uh, uh, like uh, how desirable you, uh, for example, you know, we give a score here is 100 and we specify if we if we don't have uh, toxicity, but have undesirable immune response, however, we achieve uh, the best uh, uh, efficacy outcome, then we give a score 80 here, here, right? Whether you give it 80 or 70, not matter that much for the absolute value. The kind of the, uh, the trend, it matters more. So here you give it 80. And if we move to uh, 
outcome to be stable disease and you gave a 50, so the difference is 30, but the, probably you, you want to achieve favor more about to achieve efficacy uh, outcome to be complete or partial response. You give 90 here is 50. That means your preference here is more than this situation. And the relative values uh, matters more than the uh, absolute value, basically. Okay, for a given dose, uh, it's true uh, utility can be given using uh, the following integration and given uh, interim data DN collected from the first N patients at the decision-making time point in the trial, the utility of the dose D is estimated by its posterior mean. After we define the utility, then we can define the optimal biological dose uh, here. So let pi t um, be the probability when the toxicity outcome being one denotes the, uh, denotes the toxicity rate and pi e denotes the response rate, which is the efficacy outcome uh, being at least a stable disease. Uh, and let phi t denote the upper limit of the toxicity rate and phi e denote the lower limit of the response rate. Uh, both like a, a limit phi e and phi t has to be specified by our physicians. And we define the optimal biological dose as a dose with the highest utility, which is satisfying that uh, the its uh, toxicity rate is below the upper limit phi t and its efficacy pi e uh, has to be greater than the lower limit of phi e. And based on interim data for the first uh, N patients, we define a dose D as uh, admissible if it satisfies both the safety requirement and efficacy requirement. The safety requirement is uh, specified using this, uh, which means that the toxicity probability less than the upper limit phi t based on the data is greater than the uh, pre-specified threshold CT. And the efficacy requirement means its efficacy, uh, its response rate being greater than the uh, lower limit of the uh, lower limit phi e based on the data has to be greater than uh, a cutoff value CE. And both cutoff values are pre-specified toxicity and efficacy cutoffs. And for those, uh, those levels uh, satisfy both conditions, the set of admissible doses uh, is noted by uh, admissible set AN based on the first N patients here. And now that those finding algorithm can be specified uh, in this and the following slides. So assume that patients are treated in cohort size M with a maximum sample size capital N. And so here we have a total number of capital R uh, cohorts of patients. And the first cohort of patient is treated at the lowest dose level D1. And assume that uh, we have a lowercase r cohorts of patient being treated in this trial. And we haven't uh, reached the uh, maximum sample size. So let the DH denotes the current highest tried dose level and the CES denotes the probability for escalation based on the toxicity. And we know like the, uh, at this moment, we have a, a lowercase m patient treated here. And how to make the decision for the uh, dose assignment for the next uh, cohort patient, R plus one cohort patients, uh, first, let's consider this. If the posterior probability of the toxicity at the highest dose level we have tried uh, satisfy this uh, condition, okay? And uh, we know like the highest dose level we tried is not the highest dose, is not a DJ. And then we treat the new coming patient uh, of the patient uh, at the next higher dose level. That means if the current data show that the highest uh, tried dose is safe, okay, satisfy this condition. We want to continue explore the dose space by treating the next cohort patient at the next higher new dose level. If that condition not satisfied, that means the current tried uh, highest dose is already uh, too toxic. 
And then we will identify the admissible sets AN and adapt to randomize the new coming uh, cohort patient, R plus one's cohort patient to the uh, dose level DJ with a probability uh, specified th like this here, which is the posterior probability that uh, dose J is optimal dose having the highest posterior mean of utility. And we restrict uh, the randomization only in the admissible dose uh, a N to avoid treating patients at doses that are futile or overly toxic. Of course, if the uh, admissible cells A N is empty, then the trial will be early terminated. And uh, uh, if we are not early terminated, we will continue this process to uh, assign the dose level uh, for the new coming cohort of patients. Once the maximum sample size capital N is exhausted, then uh, the dose in the admissible uh, sets with the largest uh, posterior mean utility will be recommended as the optimal biologic dose. Uh, we evaluated the performance of the uh, design using simulation studies. And in the simulation, we specify uh, five doses. Uh, with a maximum sample size 60 and the treat will treat patient in a cohort uh, size of three. And in this study, our clinician recommended that toxicity upper bound to have a fee T equal to uh, 30% and the lower limit of efficacy is 30% too also, yeah. Then we calibrated that the probability cutoffs of CTCE being uh, 0 0.05 and uh, for de defining uh, the admissible those uh, dose doses and uh, CES uh, equal to 0 0.5 for those exhalation. All these cutoffs are calibrated through simulation studies. So uh, I show you the result using these cutoffs so you can see that the results are kind of reasonable here. And we set the uh, prior estimates for the Emacs model alpha parameters uh, like this. And uh, uh, as a reference, we compare the proposed design to a design only considers efficacy and uh, toxicity outcomes, and we call it F-toxic design. And uh, under each scenario, we simulate uh, 1,000 trials. So uh, these are the four scenarios I'm gonna show you in the simulation results. And uh, <coughs> In each of the scenario, you can see uh, uh, three curves here. The, the dotted curve represents the dose toxicity. And uh, so from low dose to high dose in scenario one, the toxicity can be increasing, right? And uh, the dashed line re represents the efficacy response curve. So in, in scenario one, you can see like a, a uh, efficacy stay high and a little bit increase till dose level two, then decrease after dose level two. And the solid line represents the uh, immune response is keep increasing as dose increase in all the four scenarios. And in each of the scenario, the true optimal biological dose is circled. So like in scenario one and the dose level two is a true optimal biological dose. In scenario two, and uh, uh, the dose uh, the efficacy curve uh, uh, decrease after dose level three, and, uh, and both uh, uh, toxicity and uh, immune response keep increasing as dose increase. And uh, dose level three is a uh, uh, true optimal biological dose. Scenario uh, three. Uh, uh, Efficacy uh, uh, keep increasing as dose increase, and the toxicity uh, keep increasing as dose increasing. Of course, is the increasing is uh, much faster after dose level three, and in scenario four, uh, it's kind of a a, a scenario. It's more like a, we uh, have the uh, 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 chemotherapy uh, studies, and you have uh, both, uh, you, you have the uh, efficacy keep increasing as dose increasing. And the efficacy curve and the uh, immunotherapy curve is kind of uh, increase almost the same uh, uh, speed as dose increase. 
And the last dose, the dose level five is a true optimal biologic dose. And these slides show you the simulation results for scenario one and two. And in each scenario, uh, in the table, each column represents the uh, parameters for each dose level, from dose level one to dose level five. The first row uh, represents the uh, true mean value for the uh, immune re response. And the second row represents the toxicity probability. And the third row, represent the uh, efficacy probability. We have two probabilities. The first probability is uh, uh, response being stable disease. And the second probability is uh, uh, efficacy outcome being uh, CR or PR, it's complete or partial response. And the next row represents the true utility, mean utility for each dose level. Then for our proposed design and the design of uh, FTOX, we present the selection probability uh, for each dose level as the uh, optimal uh, biologic dose and number of patients treated at each dose level. For the first scenario, as we know, like a, uh, uh, dose level two is a true optimal biologic dose. And you can see like uh, uh, by considering the immune response, uh, the proposed design has uh, successfully uh, selected the true uh, biological dose with selection probability 0.649, which is higher uh, than the selection probability using only uh, effic uh, efficacy and toxicity outcome 0.521. And uh, as we see in the previous slides in scenario one, you can see like uh, the efficacy, okay, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a slight increase then drop after those level two. That's why when you consider immune response can help us to, uh, because our efficacy in you know, proposed design the efficacy also depends on the immune response. So after we incorporating the immune response and we can uh, more accurately estimate the efficacy and uh, so that we, when we make the decision and uh, uh, we have a higher selection probability on the correct uh, optimal biologic dose. In scenario two, the dose level three is the uh, uh, true uh, uh, optimal biologic dose. In this scenario, uh, the difference between the proposed design and uh, uh, FTOX design is more kind of uh, uh, obvious. Okay, so uh, the proposed design have a selection probability equal to 0 0.732. And the FTOX design only have selection probability 0.183. And uh, you can see like uh, for, if we only consider um, efficacy and the toxicity, and uh, uh, we can make the wrong decision, right? We have a higher probability, it's like dose level two as uh, uh, optimal biologic dose. And why, and, you know, because the, Efficacy in scenario two also, you know, uh, goes down after dose level three. So after we consider immune response, that will help the uh, dose uh, selection. In scenario three, we uh, we kind of observe the similar trend, and the proposed design almost double the selection probability compared to FTOX design, and also treating because this, and uh, we also treat like a roughly. Uh, two more patients on the uh, true optimal uh, uh, dose levels in scenario three. And as in scenario four, because the behavior of the efficacy and immune response are very similar. So in this case, uh, there's a kind of a minimum advantage after we consider using the immune response. So you can see like the proposed design and the uh, FTOX design both uh, yield a similar selection probability. Uh, dose level three is a true optimal biological dose. Both design gave a, a kind of a 73% selection probability for this dose level. Uh, we also did some like sensitivity analysis for the uh, proposed design and uh, we uh, assessed the robustness of the performance of the design uh, by using another set of utility values and uh, also using a smaller sample size. And also we tried a, a kind of a two alternative priors for the alpha parameters in this uh, 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 research question. So first, uh, 
when we use uh, alternative utilities here, uh, the top section is our original utility. And uh, the second, uh, the bottom part is the uh, alternative utility. As you can see the difference is in this section. <laughs> so in this section, when we have toxicity, okay. So the tox when we have observed toxicity uh, in the original utility, the values range from uh, 10 to 45, right? And here in the alt alternative utility, then we have, we specify a much higher utility in this section. So that means, you know, uh, we give such a higher score here, means like uh, patients are, allowing, uh, are willing to tolerate a high toxicity to attain high efficacy here. That's why you give a, a higher value. And by using the alternative utility, let's compare the performance of the proposed uh, design. So uh, the results, uh, uh, we compare the uh, results with the original and the alternative utilities in terms of number of patients and uh, selection probability of, uh, of the true uh, optimal biological dose for each scenario. And uh, the dark bar represents the results for the uh, original utility and the the gray bar represents the result using the alternative utility. So in the left section is the number of patients treated. You can see like uh, by changing the utility, okay, uh, in terms of number of patients, uh, both uh, the design kind of uh, treat the similar number of patients at the true optimal uh, biological dose. The difference is less, is roughly two, is less than uh, a three. And uh, in terms of selection probability and uh, both, okay, the design using both uh, utility functions and have a, a similar performance in terms of uh, correctly select the true optimal biological dose. And, uh, uh, you know, when we specify a much higher score for those scenarios with toxicity equal to yes, and we still achieve uh, like a correct selection probability uh, in all the four scenarios, which then 60%. Also, we tried uh, if we, uh, you know, reduce the sample size, how much, you know, uh, the design will be suffered from smaller sample size. In here, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, the dark bar represents sample size 60 and the gray bar represents sample size uh, uh, 42. The left panel, of course, in, we reduce the total sample size and the number of patients treated at uh, the true optimal biological dose will uh, drop, and that's reasonable, right? And uh, in the red panel, in terms of selection probability, when we have less patients treated, and we um, the accuracy of estimation uh, uh, suffers, so like the selection probability will suffer. But the overall, you can see, even we use a smaller sample size as 42. And uh, for each of the scenario, uh, we still maintain like a roughly close to 50% or higher selection probability for the true optimal biological dose. And the next is, you know, uh, we, in this proposed design, we kind of uh, first time to consider the immune uh, response in the design. and. Uh, we specified the EMAX model for our immune, immune response and uh, how sensitive the uh, alpha parameters in the EMAX model can affect the design. So in this is uh, our original uh, prior estimates for the alpha parameters. Then we tried the two other sets alpha parameters. And uh, then uh, we compare the performance of uh, the like the design using these three sets of uh, prior estimates for alpha parameters uh, for each scenario. And uh, you can see like in each of the scenario for each dose level and the selection probability using different alpha uh, prior estimates, the performance will be similar. And in terms of number of patients treated at each dose level for, <coughs> excuse me, for each scenario, scenario they are all very uh, close. So you can see like our design is not that sensitive to the prior estimates of the Emax model parameters. Uh, uh, this is a, a brief summary for what I just present. 
So we have proposed uh, basing a phase one, two clinical trial design for immune, uh, immunotherapy by simultaneous considering immune response, toxicity, and uh, efficacy. And here we use Emacs model for the marginal distribution of the immune response. And uh, we use a latent variable approach to model the joint distribution of the binary toxicity and ordinal efficacy outcomes. Our simulation studies show that the proposed design has the desirable operating characteristics and it has a robust performance. Uh, and this is the references for the uh, talk. And thank you very much. So if there are any questions. Uh, thank you much for, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, for the QA, uh, please use the, the QA box. And I think right now we don't have any QA. Yeah, it's in the box. So uh, so let, let me ask uh, one question. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think the, the uh, YE, right, the efficacy variable. So I think you didn't include those, right, but only including uh, YI in the model. So I, I think I miss why you didn't include uh, those for the modeling of YE. Here, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right. We shouldn't yeah. include uh, those here or? or? That's a really good question. Okay, uh, it's kind of a, a we specify we specify the uh, efficacy outcome not directly uh, uh, model the relationship between the efficacy and those levels. Why we do this? Because when we apply immune uh, immunotherapy, right? So how we achieve the immune uh, and how we achieve the efficacy is through the immune response. That's why I we only model the uh, efficacy uh, on top of on top of uh, like a uh, uh, immune res uh, immune response, and we know like uh, through the Emax model, immune response definitely depends on uh, uh, those level already. That's why we use this model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, yeah, another question I had is the uh, the in the simulation. So you have the uh, the uh, efficacy and uh, toxicity only uh, selection procedure, right? Uh, as a comparator. So, uh, so uh, could you tell me a little more about the uh, efficacy toxicity only section? Group? Oh, okay. So are you so, using the same joint model or uh, what's, what's the difference? Oh, uh, the aftox model, okay. Mm -hmm. Aftox model, the tox, uh, so, uh, oh, let me see, yeah, okay. So for each of those level, definitely you you know their uh, you you have estimates there of their toxicity, right? Mm -hmm. And you also have their estimates for their uh, uh, efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we you know like a uh, I should say this. Mm. Let me use this. Okay. And, it's also using the utility uh, approach. Instead mm -hmm. of we consider the uh, three outcomes, we only consider toxicity and efficacy. So you can see like uh, it's, uh, in, in that table, you won't have like uh, so many rows. You will remove this column. So the, we'll use a similar utility uh, table when we use FTOX design. But you can see like uh, because that and uh, in that way and uh, uh, without considering immune response and you define the uh, desirability of the, uh, a scenario, okay, only based on the toxicity and efficacy outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So the utility function is different, right? The utility function, so, because so we don't consider uh, the one outcome. So then by definition, I think the, the biologically optimal dose is different, right? If you use uh, efficacy toxicity. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I see. Um, There's yes. no, the, the, the thing is, uh, uh, when we present uh, this uh, methods, okay, uh, I, I think you, you, you also probably experienced a similar situation. Mm -hmm. They will always ask you to compare with some reference design, right. <laughs> reference method, uh, but there's no existing, when we, when we, when we have this method, I want to publish this, and there's mm -hmm. no existing method to consider this. So there's no good uh, reference. That's why mm -hmm. I think that's the best that we can do. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. 
in a sense. So uh, yes, another question I have is the, uh, I mean, about the uh, how to uh, derive those utility functions. So you, I think you mentioned that as uh, so you approach to clinicians and the patient and then uh, elicit uh, this uh, utility function, right? So, uh, so do you need to approach uh, multiple clinicians or multiple patients, or you can just ask one clinician or one patient? Or if you ask the uh, multiple clinician, <laughs> you get the, the different uh, utility Score. function. Yes, <laughs> scores. How, how do you integrate uh, those stuff? Do, do you have, uh, yes, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah this is a very practical and very yeah, good yeah, question. Yeah. I, yeah, actually, because I don't I, have experience though. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Actually, I have this kind of a situation. Uh, usually we, uh, as a statistician, we, we seldom like uh, have a face-to-face -face meeting with patients, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, uh, the patients, input is also the clinician or physicians we work with our collaborator right so uh of course the um, the clinician's experience somehow uh, kind of will come from uh, his or her uh, patients that's why i'm thinking is from both clinicians and the patients but uh, we have faced some 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 situations with like two clinicians have different mm -hmm. opinion okay mm -hmm. uh uh Okay, practically speaking, okay, we have to uh, meet together, uh, obtain some agreement so that we specify utility to use for the proposed design. And as I show you, like uh, the design is not that sensitive to the utility score. And you know, whether here I give an 80 or I give a 90, not um, mean mm -hmm. much, okay? Means and make uh, kind of makes huge difference if I here give a 80, but here give a 50. That will make make a huge difference. That means as a clinician, I give a different, totally different preference for different situations. Of course, some situ some clinicians even will give a kind of very similar score when they achieve uh, efficacy as a stable disease or complete or partial, partial response. I have to tell you, like, uh, uh, for many, uh, many, uh, based on my <laughs> my working experience with my, my collaborators, in many situations, like uh, the efficacy endpoint for immunotherapy, it's kind of a long term. It's no longer short term. However, when we uh, make the uh, decision during the, this process of those finding, we want a quick uh, outcomes come, come back so that we can make a, a decision based on current available data, right? Mm -hmm. So usually when we uh, specify these two outcomes, the FA Alcazella, we, we don't want the long-term outcomes, we want short outcomes. But for immunotherapy, and sometimes patient can have a, a kind of a, short-term period are showing progress, then will achieve their clinical like a response. It can happen because their progression not purely caused by the, uh, you know, but uh, because the drug doesn't work, it, because the immune system is starting to work and it got some uh, inflammation then cause, you know, uh, you see, uh, you observe a uh, progress of disease. So in this situation, sometimes our clinician prefer to have a similar score for these two columns. They don't want to differentiate like whether achieved stable disease or complete or partial response. And as in many of the uh, uh, working experiments I have, you know, I have my utility function score uh, is, is shorter than this one, not to use this uh, kind of ordinal uh, outcomes for the efficacy. And uh, it, Actually, uh, when we uh, specify the efficacy, we say, okay, the efficacy for the first two cycles so that we can opt uh, obtain these uh, variables, var value much quicker so that I make the decision. But the uh, uh, practice speaking, and when we finally evaluate the efficacy for this treatment, we often use like the best response or overall response. This is much longer terms uh, to observe a clinical outcome. Then, uh, you raise a really good question, and practically speaking, and we make a smaller table for utilities mm -hmm. used in practice. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. So, do we have another question? I cannot see the QA table. Is that because I share my slides? No, yeah, I think we uh, no, yeah, so, yeah, we don't have. Uh, anything in QA box here. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I think maybe that's it. So, uh, 
So again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Liu, uh, for a wonderful talk. So the uh, next seminar uh, will be uh, on December 7, right, and after Thanksgiving. So we'll have the uh, Professor uh, Giovanni Parvijani. So, okay, so uh, the folks uh, see you uh, ne next month. Maybe we, we close uh, today. <laughs> thank you very much again. Thank you. Very wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.